Thanks for checking out a sermon from First United Methodist Church located in Sheridan, Wyoming. To learn more about who we are, please check out our webpage at fumcsheridanwy.org. The sermon today joins the disciples in the upper room when Jesus gives the gift of the Holy Spirit. The scripture reading is from John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? And I ask that the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing and glorifying to you. Amen. Uh, So today is Pentecost. Try again. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Today is Pentecost. Yay! That's it right there. Now for us, this is the day that we remember and celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit along with the birth of the followers of the way, as the early church was called. In the giving of the paraclete that we heard Jesus talk about in the farewell discourse just a couple weeks ago, this is the reminder for us. And it was a beautiful surprise to come into the the entryway this morning and to be greeted by the lily. The lily that... We talked about all through Lent and used as our Easter illustration. It's blooming on Pentecost. You can't plan things like that. That's exciting. Woo-hoo. It's beautiful. Yet another reminder, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, how, how much Easter, the resurrection, and Pentecost go together. Now, I think it's also important for us to remember that the gift of the Holy Spirit is, well, it's a pretty big deal. I think for, for us, when we're in a relationship with someone for a really long time, there comes a moment where we start taking that relationship for granted. And we expect certain things instead of getting excited about experiencing the relationship. But I can't help but wonder if there aren't moments in our lives where we take the Holy Spirit for granted as well. When we look at the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was only given to a a select few. Not everybody received the gift of the Holy Spirit, yet we live in the moment where the gift of the Holy Spirit is open and available to all of us. That is something to sit with and reflect on and to give thanks for. The Spirit is given as a gift from God. I so appreciate the Gospel of John. It's challenging to read and to understand, but I appreciate the Gospel of John because this morning we get to hear John's in John's gospel, the, the response, the, the picture, the, 
the experience of Jesus giving the Spirit to the disciples. Now, I think it's important for us just to, to sort of like set the stage. Okay, if we're going to we're going to dance with the scripture this morning. We need to set the stage. So let's just take a step back to see the full picture here. Now, when we meet with the disciples today, we meet them back in the upper room. Just a few verses before are the same verses that we read on Easter Sunday about the resurrection, about Mary coming to the tomb, seeing the empty tomb, going back, getting the disciples, the disciples running to the tomb, walking away confused and puzzled, Mary coming back, crying in the garden, meeting the gardener, which turns out to be Jesus, right? It's the story that, that this story, this is the continuation in John, of the first Easter Sunday, John's Pentecost experience is on the exact same day that the disciples find out that Jesus is resurrected, making the resurrection and Pentecost connected. So it is, it's amazing (laughs) that our lily has bloomed. Uh, today. All right, so here's a couple, couple pieces that I just want you to keep in mind as we look at these verses this morning. First, we get this scene of the disciples in the upper room. When we start to think about the disciples, how many individuals do we think about? Okay, 12 is the, is the natural number we think about. Uh, at this point, there really aren't 12 disciples anymore. There's 11. Right. Here is the challenge. It's the Gospel of John. Period. That, that's the challenge. So the, the challenge here is for us to, to instead of thinking as the, the disciples as being literally the 11 people, huddled in that room, we need to expand that gathering because, again, the Gospel of John is not talking specifically about the 11. What John is trying to point at is the gathering of the disciples in a way, he uses that language, disciples, to help us understand or represent the community of faith. So there are more than just the 11 gathered together in this upper room the, this gathering of disciples is used as, well, in all reality, we could put ourselves in that space because we can be, we are disciples. We can join them, which helps the, the hearers of this story to connect with this story in turn. That way, we're not just thinking this is happening to the 11. I sort of want to know if Mary is still in that space, trying to get them, the rest of them to go, I saw him. Why won't you believe me? Because clearly they, they either didn't understand or they were wrestling with the report that Mary had given them because we hear the first verse is the disciples were hanging outside around a fire cooking hot dogs. No, who said that? That was great. Yeah, that was like perfect timing. No, they were scared for their lives, terrified, behind locked doors, gathered together, more than likely for moral support, wondering what was going to happen next. And I can just picture Mary in there going, what's wrong with you people? What's, what's go, why? Why are you having such a hard time with this? Yet, if we, again, place ourselves in that space, I think that we have all sat in that space before. Come to a moment in life where we're not sure what to do nervous or scared of what's going to happen next. 
not sure how to move forward, maybe wishing that we didn't have to, wanting to stay in the past, but yet that's not possible. Have we ever been in that space with the disciples? The disciples were scared that what they just saw, their teacher, their leader, their Messiah, what they just saw happen to him might happen to them next. Wondering if they just wasted the last days, weeks, months, years following this guy because we thought that he was the one. Thinking that he was the Messiah, but was he? All these things, the disciples, I would guess, were going to dance. They're struggling with. The beauty of this story is that John doesn't leave them in this space for very long. Because Jesus comes through the locked doors and stands with them. This space, this fear, this stress, this wondering is where Jesus meets them. Jesus meets them in the confusion and he stands with them. When we find ourselves in a place of disillusionment, of fear, of struggling, what do you long for? I don't think it's any mistake that when Jesus enters into that space, how does he greet them? Peace be with you. As good Methodists, we respond, that's right, and also with you. This, these are the words that, that Jesus speaks to them first. Peace be with you. When he says these words, they, they are meant to, to fulfill one of the promises that we heard just a few chapters before in the farewell discourse. The peace that Jesus is giving to this community of faith, to the disciples who are locked away for fear. Did you notice how John uses the fear of? You know how, did you notice how he says fear of the Jews? I think it's important that we recognize the purpose, one of the purposes behind John's gospel being written. And I've shared this with you before, but you're going to hear it again. The purpose, one of the purposes of John's gospel was to write to the early Jewish Christians who were ostracized and kicked out of their synagogues, struggling with wondering whether or not this Jesus was really worth following when they have experienced such persecution because the Christians were blamed for the Romans burning down the temple. And so for John to be able to connect that the disciples, the early community of faith that are gathered in the upper room, they are there because they fear the Jews. That's an important detail for the listeners of this gospel, for the early listeners of this gospel, because it helps connect them with the story. That even if they are in that space of of fearing the Jewish leaders of the synagogue, Jesus meets them in that space and gives them peace. Gives them peace. Peace can lead to hope. Absolutely. So it's important for us to to recognize in these first early verses what what we're facing. When we are facing fear that we face that fear embraced in the peace of Christ. Just like the disciples in that room that day, 
just like the early Jewish Christian community, we join in that faith connection and face fear in Christ's peace. All right, now, in Jesus showing up and talking with the disciples, he actually gives them peace twice, right? Uh, have you ever had to been told, told something twice before it finally sunk in to, I mean, uh, I'm not the only one, right? I have a hard head, and you can see it all. So the second piece that Jesus gives is also the commissioning of the faith community, uh, he, he says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. The gift of the Holy Spirit, then, is directly linked with these words. Because right after, we hear that Jesus says this and then breathes onto them. And it's in this breath that they receive the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit then is empowering the community to continue the work that Jesus begun. Now, I think it's important, again, Gospel of John, the Greek that is used here for breathed. If you scour the rest of the New Testament, do you know how many more times you're going to find it? None. This is the one and only occurrence of this word in Greek, in the entire New Testament. So it invites us then to start thinking through what is John trying to get at here? And so if we start to think about breath, what are some, is there anything that comes to mind when you think about breath, life? Yeah, and it's directly connected to life, isn't it? Because if we rewind you know, you skip. I'm trying to think of what the terminology today. Rewind talks to me because I'm used to VHS tapes still, but there's going to come a time where you can't use that terminology anymore. If you start at the beginning, how's that? If you start at the beginning and we look at Genesis, John is trying to get us to, to think back through some of the Old Testament stories where we recognize the breath of God's presence. And so in Genesis, we hear uh, the description of God breathing life into the first human. We hear in Ezekiel, the, remember the valley of dry bones? We hear that in that story, we hear the breath of life being given. And even though it doesn't come right out and talk about it, One of my favorite pieces to think about when we start talking about the breath of God is in the Lord's Prayer. And we hear our Father who art in heaven. We're wondering, how does he get to the breath of God in that? You know, in the Greek, going back to the Greek, heaven is plural, Yet we don't translate it plural. We translate it singular because it's confusing because our understanding of heaven is not the same as what the early church understood heaven as. They understood the heavens. So it really is our Father who art in the heavens. The threefold understanding of heaven, heaven being the spiritual realm, which is typically what we think of when we think of heaven, the spiritual realm, However, the second level, that's the third level of heaven. The second level of heaven is the stars in the sky, the heavens. The first level, I think it's the first level. I might have the numbers backed up, confused, uh, but just go with me. First level of heaven is the very atmosphere in which the heaven exists. So we actually breathe in heaven so when we say, our Father who art in the heavens, we're, we're recognizing that God is in the very atmosphere, the air in which we breathe, that God is in, the, is in uh, outer space and the stars and in the sky, and, and God is in the spiritual realm. And so each and every time we breathe in the air that we breathe, we breathe in a bit of God, because God exists. 
breath of God. Maybe John is trying to get us to understand that in this moment, that something new, the resurrection brings about something new, that the gift of the Holy Spirit brings about something new, that this is a new creation. It is the Holy Spirit then that in this new life, in this new creation that sustains us, it's the Holy Spirit that we are given that, again, to empower the disciples in that room that day to do the work, to continue to the, do the work that Jesus began. Because we hear Jesus giving the commission then, giving the, the Holy Spirit and then giving the disciples the commission Now, one thing I will say is that in this commission, this is probably one of the most confusing sentences that we could read in John, all about forgiving and retaining sins. To try and make sense of this phrase, we need to first understand how John refers to sin throughout his gospel. Remember, the challenge in reading John is that it's John. Am I preaching too long? No one's going to want to sit on my side as an acolyte, are they? What do you think of when you think of the word sin? Okay, missing the mark, right. Because we know that it is a arch, an old archery term that is about missing the mark. We typically like to connect with, with the word sin, moral or behavioral transgressions, right? Missing the mark. However... If you look throughout John's gospel, it's not about moral or behavior. It's about theological understanding. John sees sin as to not, but through the lens of not receiving the revelation of who God is through Jesus. To overlook the incarnation and to recognize God with us. So when John starts talking about the commission that Jesus is giving them, what we hear being called to this community of faith is to continue to make God in Jesus known to the world. In other words, we're called to continue the work that God started when God sent Jesus into the world. So we are then called to make God known to those around us. I hope that clears that one up. In the farewell discourse, we hear Jesus promising his disciples a life shaped by by joy, grounded in peace, and guided by the work of the Holy Spirit. And in these few verses, these few verses, we experience all of these promises being fulfilled by the guiding work of the Holy Spirit. What we acknowledge then is that the church's identity comes from Easter, from the resurrection, and from Pentecost that we are shaped by the gifts from the risen Christ, the gifts he promised and the ensuring of his presence among us. Jesus sends us to do his work. However, that work is only alluded to in John's gospel. We don't hear a real clear picture in these verses as to what that looks like, but when we dance with the entire gospel We recognize the work that Jesus does throughout his gospel. What the faith community is challenged to do is to bear witness, to bear witness to the identity of God revealed in Jesus, which we can understand that identity through a single word. Anyone want to venture a guess what that word might be? I would say love, love. Just a few verses before, Jesus commanded the disciples to love one another, giving a possible picture of what the church's mission is to look like. 
by loving one another as Jesus loves, the faith community reveals God to the world. A couple weeks ago, we talked about just how difficult it is to love one another. Hence the reason why we need the Holy Spirit. The faith community, we are called to reveal God to the world. By showing God to the world, the church gives the opportunity for God to be experienced. We get to bear witness to the love of God found in Jesus. The Gospel of John helps us then, helps us to realize that to celebrate the resurrection is also to celebrate the beginning of the church's mission to the world. Jesus breathes new life into the disciples that day and reminds us of new life we receive from the Holy Spirit at work within us too. Pentecost then reminds us of that gift, that precious gift. And John reminds us of the commission that comes with that gift to continue the work that Jesus started. When I reflected on uh, Pentecost this year, it it reminded me of getting to the end of a really good movie and it's drawing you in and it starts to get intense and then all of a sudden across the screen comes three words, to be continued. And you just want to throw your hands up in the air and say, no! Pentecost reminds us that Jesus' work has not yet been completed. The Holy Spirit has been poured out over us, given to us to empower us to do the work that Christ has started. May we breathe in the breath of God receiving the newness of life from the Holy Spirit and continue Jesus' work as we bear witness to the love of God found in Jesus. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you. We thank you for this day, for the gift of your divine spirit at work in us. Help us, God, to breathe you in, living in the newness of your life so that we may go and love others. God, we love you. We thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this week's sermon. We would love for you to join us again for worship in person or online, and we look forward to being with you next time.